Hello everybody and welcome to the latest episode of The Surge. So um, today I'll be talking about chest tubes, but we're not going to be talking about how to put them in. Um, I think that there's a lot of very good information out there. If you look at Life in the Fast Lane, um, if you look at uh, a lot of the MCRIT stuff, basically any open source eMERGE reference, you're going to get some really good stuff on chest tubes. And I mean really good, like better than anything on, in a textbook, in, in my opinion. Things like how to do intercostal blocks, um, you know, uh, how to calculate dosages for xylocaine, uh, how to put a tube in. But what I think we've had a very big gap in, and I think people are very sensitive about, and that's why I wanted to talk to you about it today, is how to troubleshoot chest tube placement issues. I'm probably going to do this as a three-parter, very similar to uh, what I've been doing with pediatrics, in that I, I think I'll talk about what happens acutely, and then how to troubleshoot an indwelling chest tube, and how to deal with chest tube infections, and retained hemothoraces, and things like that. I don't think that covering everything in one talk is necessarily good, because there are certain concepts that are a little bit disturbing. Uh, for some people, especially if you're not comfortable with surgical procedures in general, you know, we're, we're not all going to be perfect at this stuff. So, five, four, three, two. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of The Surge. My name is Saud, and today I want to talk to you about um, chest tubes. I'm not going to be talking about how to place them. There's a lot of excellent resources out there, many of them open source. If you look at Life in the Fast Lane, if you look at uh, mcrit.org, uh, all those places have select references on how to put in a chest tube, and they're simply amazing. I could never do anything that good. And, you know, I would challenge most textbooks to come up with, with data that's that data-driven and that evidence-based. So I think um, rather than do that, I think I'll talk about what happens when you need to troubleshoot a chest tube. And it's not going to be about uh, empyemas, air leaks, retained hemothoraces. That'll be a different talk, possibly two or three different talks. It's going to be mainly about, you know, hypothetical scenarios that, that, that keep people up at night. So let's talk about this. So you have a, insert age, 70-year-old. Previous history of cabbage times four, no past medical surgical history of note apart from the cabbage. He comes into you six months after the cabbage, relatively septic. Um, he's in your ICU. Um, you ask your resident to put in a line. Uh, the resident's putting in the line. The line goes in perfectly. It's ultrasound guided, but it takes multiple attempts to get there. And, you know, it's not the, his fault, the patient is clearly septic and his veins are collapsed and he's had a previous central line there. But in the chest x-ray post, you notice bilateral pneumothoraces. So you ask your resident to put in a chest tube and he does, rightly so, he puts it into the bigger pneumothorax because that's what he's been taught to do. And then he asks for a repeat chest x-ray and he gives you a call. And this is what the chest x-ray looks like. Now, just to outline what we're looking at here. So um, you're going to have to ask yourself where it is first, right? Um, seeing this would scare most people. It's a transmediastinal chest tube. And potentially, it's a transmediastinal stab wound. It's not something that everybody's comfortable with. I agree with you. But what are we going to do? How do we confirm where it is? So... Your patient's a bit septic. You'll try not to move them that much, but you manage to get a lateral, and then you see this. So it's clearly going through the anterior chest, and it's not really penetrating anything big, but how do you address that problem, right? So you have a number of options here, right? So first option is you just do a CT scan. Cross-sectionally, you can tell where it is. Second option is you do a double scope. If there's no penetration of any vital structures, you take the chest tube out. Third option is you do both and take the chest tube out. Reset other tubes. Fourth option is you decide to call somebody for help, and they probably give you the three other options. And they say, well, 
I would pick whatever they prefer. What you don't have is the option of shouting at somebody for this. And that's what I would urge you to learn first, that whenever something that looks that bad, and it only looks bad, I can guarantee you, when it looks that bad, the worst thing that you can do to the person who's already in shock and already feeling guilty is to destroy them before you have a solution to your problem. So recognize this. Chest tube misplacement is in fact associated with a significant mortality. It's been described in the literature time and time again, and I will prove it to you today. But because of that mortality, as the person in charge, you should, and the person who's responsible, you should be able to have a plan to deal with the complication. That plan can be the options that I outlined earlier. It can even be to call a thoracic surgeon to take care of the problem for you, which I would recommend if I'm being honest. I have a comfort with chest tubes. People who don't, in our service, everybody puts in a chest tube. That's how they learn. They're supervised for the first 10, and then they supervise other people for the next 10 with a TTL in the room. That's how I train them. Whenever I'm in the ICU, we're putting in pigtails as much as we can, and we're training each other to put in the pigtails. It's just the way that things go. Okay? Supervision, dedicated time to train people, doesn't necessarily stop this from happening. It will happen. There's a percentage in every hospital. There's no procedure without risks. That's the first thing that you learn in surgery. But what it does do is it gives you an ability to think in a logical manner and not destroy the person in front of you who's already panicking. Otherwise, they wouldn't be calling you. So option five is to take a deep breath. Think about why this happened. So if, if the patient... If, if the resident had used a trocar and just shoved it in, okay, there should be a hemothorax on the contralateral side, which there really isn't. I think we can both agree. There's a gastric bubble. There's a bit of a shadow, but there's no hemothorax. And you can actually confirm that on, on the, the secondary view. There's no hemothorax on that side, right? So you must have gone through a bloodless plane of sorts or a plane with a minimum amount of blood. The chest tube is not oscillating and it's not bubbling. And on the contralateral side the pneumothorax has expanded. That can only make sense if there was a communication between both sides of the chest beforehand. And that's why you shouldn't panic. If you have a communication between both sides of the chest, either because they've had a previous history of cabbage and things have adhesed and healed in that manner because they'd opened up both sides of the pleura or something else, then your patient's fine. All you have to do is pull back the tube Make sure that there's no air leak and cite the second tube on the contralateral side. If you look at the literature, the case report that I just told you about was published and it's free access now, so I'm not breaking any rules, was published as an unusual complication of a median sternotomy. Ten years later, it was published a second time as a congenital anomaly. And it's almost the exact same thing. It was inserted for attention pneumothorax and it went over to the contralateral side. There was even a New England Journal case of the week that showed clear communication and that this pathology is a known congenital anomaly. It's been re represented in the literature time and time again. And in all those cases, every single one of those cases, you could write a case series if you wanted to. Maybe I should write a case series. I don't know. They all did fine. There was one case where the tube was indwelling for 24 hours and they scoped the patient to make sure that there were no erosions and there was a grade one erosion of the esophagus. But in all those cases, the patient did fine. So imagine how bad you would feel if you had been inappropriate with your resident and with your team, if you just lost it and started screaming at them. So first thing to recognize is Chest tube misplacement has been very well documented in the literature. There is no need to panic. There is no need to scream at people. It's a difficult situation, but if you're dealing with acute care cases, whether it's acute care medicine, emergency medicine, ICU, anesthesia, surgery, trauma, acute care surgery, no matter what label you want to wear, for you to work in this business, you're going to have to develop a tolerance 
for when things aren't going well and you get an outcome that you weren't expecting. All these patients did fine, and the literature proves that it may not have been something that's iatrogenic to begin with. If there's one case that was iatrogenic and another eight cases that weren't reported in the literature over the past 20 years, chances are the iatrogenic case was another congenital buffalo chest. Okay, and that's what that, that's actually called. It's called a buffalo chest because buffalo have clear communication between both sides of their chest. And they studied animal models with this, and what they found was they're more right ventricularly sensitive because of changes in the transmural pressure. I have no life, I agree with you. So how did you do with that while I was going through the case? Were you panicking when you saw those x-rays? What would you have done? Would you have actually screamed at anybody? Would you have uh, been angry or livid? Um, five years ago, I probably would have been a little bit annoyed uh, as the senior resident on service or something, or like the senior fellow on service. Um, these days, I, I'm a little bit more um, goal-oriented, let's say. That doesn't mean that, that I won't use controlled aggression from time to time to get people motivated, but I'm more goal-oriented. And certainly, I try to be uh, less inappropriate than, than some of my colleagues when, when they see a picture like that. So when you um, look at how safe we are putting in chest tubes, and this isn't the best study, but this was nice and simple, and it was open access, so I figured why not, okay? If you audit people's perceptions of their safety, everybody thinks that they know how to put in a chest tube. When you look at how many of them know where to put it in, in the triangle of safety, there are two things that make a difference. First is, you having had some form of formal training anywhere. So if you look, the people who got it right, for the most part, had neither cardiothoracic training, nor respiratory training, nor any form of training. They were junior hospital doctors, and they were shown a picture, and they were asked where to put the chest tube in. And granted, this is only look at one metric. But in general, your subspecialty shouldn't make a difference. It did in one study, and I'll go through it in a second. But in terms of your overall knowledge base, that doesn't make a huge difference. What does make a difference to your ability to put in a chest tube and know where to put it in is whether or not you've done it supervised or unsupervised. So it's clear that you have to be there and you have to be able to do the tube yourself. That seems to be fairly clear from this study. So you need to be able to supervise people and train them to putting in chest tube safely. When you look at how many chest tubes are malpositioned, there is no data for the whole emergency room. There is data for a whole hospital. There is data for a hundred hospitals pulled together, but there is no data for an emergency room. There is data for a specific population that we see and we tend to put in chest tubes in the emergency room, and those are trauma patients. And when you look at the data, it varies between 25 and 11%, where 11% is inpatient doctors or in hospital doctors, and 25% or uh, ambulance transport-based physicians had the worst rates in terms of chest tube misplacement. Now, misplacement is defined as anywhere that's not where I think it is, which I don't think is necessarily fair because, you know, our body habitus has changed and it gets more and more complicated after that. So I certainly wouldn't take this to heart, but it gives you an idea of, of how common it is to have that misplacement of the chest tube scenario and why you shouldn't get irate. When you look at resident training, for the most part, the most common complication is in fact misplacement positionally, either into the mediastinum or into a fissure or subcutaneously. The second most common is a laceration of the intercostal artery causing bleeding, when you look at all comers and all numbers. There is no big differences in terms of median ISS, and the good news is that overall, even if you were to end up with these known complications, such as misplacement, it doesn't affect the patient's overall stay or mortality significantly. By and large, what seems to be reported in the literature is that senior residents tend to have a higher complication rate by percentage, but that's because they put in a, a smaller number of the more difficult tubes. That's the only way that you can justify it, really. And in general, uh, the highest rates of complications seems to be in the emergency room, but that just reflects the difficulty of their population too. For the most part, I would contend that if everybody had an elective chest tube to put in for a malignant effusion or a pigtail to put in, I think that everybody would do the same. But this just gives you an idea that an emergency chest tube is associated with a higher complication rate, 
and that the level of the resident might not be indicative. And what you're really looking at here is, you know, complications including positional. If you take out positional, the complication rates drop to less than 5%. Now, other factors that have been associated with better chest tube placement and overall patient outcomes, including pain control. First is adequate sedation and blockade. So my personal preference is, if you've worked with me, you know this, ketamine. I use small doses of ketamine, in addition to, if the patient's stable enough, of course, in addition to using an intercostal block. Initially, I used to do my intercostal blocks uh, pseudo-blindly. I would put the needle in until I could aspirate either some of the effusion or blood from the thoracic cavity, usually it's serosanguinous, it's not totally red, unless it's trauma, or some of the air. I try and aspirate that so that I confirm my sight. And then I inject as I'm withdrawing. And, you know, fictionally, my mentor had one time told me that it was, you would inject into the pleural space because it would numb up the pleura. I don't think it does. I'm going to be honest. Increasingly, I've been doing it ultrasound guided, and I find that it works significantly better. An ultrasound guided block, I think, is going to be the way of the future because it also gives me a target to where I'm going to be putting in the chest tube and confirms where the chest tube is going to be. Um... Once I insert the tube, or once I make my incision through the subcutaneous fat into the muscle, I use my finger to dissect into the pleural cavity, and I feel the rib above and below on the inside. And that tells me that I'm in the pleural space, and not in the abdomen, not close to the diaphragm. I feel the orientation of the diaphragm itself, and I feel for any adhesions around the lung. And then I try and guide the tube in using either a Kelly or my finger sometimes. And I direct the tube in a manner that I know it's going to rest on the base. There was a time way back when, when we used to say you direct it up for a pneumothorax and you direct it down for fluid. I don't care. Prove it to me. Prove it to me with big data. Prove to me that if I don't direct it up, the patient's more likely to have a pneumothorax persist. It makes no sense to me, right? Once I direct it in, there's always that risk that it's going to be kinked or in the fissure, particularly in smaller chests. I find that that happens more with people with smaller lungs and bigger bodies. Take that in any way you want. I don't mean anything by it. So what I do is, once the tube is in, I rotate it inside to make sure that it's freely moving. If it kinks on the inside, if it does, if there's some resistance as I'm rotating it, then I know I might be in a fissure, so I will draw slightly and redirect it, or it might be kinked, so I will draw slightly and redirect it a second time. So a freely mobile tube inside the thoracic cavity that you have confirmed you're definitely in prior to inserting the tube by feeling the rib above and below should be placed correctly in theory okay i then connect up the tube and when i do connect it i make sure that there's an airtight seal i do not look for oscillations and the reason why is because in trauma oscillations do not happen because you have a lot of retained air you might get some bubbly but you're not going to get oscillations and the oscillations are very confusing for people. And every time I hear somebody tell me about oscillations and whether or not the chest tube is oscillating in the trauma setting, or in a patient with extremely complex respiratory issues, like a patient on HFOV, for example, who just blew a pneumo, or severe ADS who just blew a pneumo, I get very annoyed because it's not the be-all and end-all. And looking for something like that, that hasn't been described definitively, and trying to make a decision based on it is just not right. It's not right for your patient, it's not right for you. We'll go through what to do in, in both a stable and unstable patient in a second, but I would not look for oscillations before connecting up the tube, and I would not clamp the tube in trauma, ever, not even on transport, unless it's air transport. In the acute trauma setting, I would never clamp the tube because you don't know if there's an air leak and the pneumothorax might reaccumulate. And then I double secure it, so I, I'll suture it with a suture above and a suture below, typically, okay? Uh, I confirm using a chest x-ray. Some people like to repeat the EFAST. I'll be honest, I, I haven't, I have that skill set, but I haven't used it recently because we've just been getting chest x-rays relatively quickly, that's all. And I, I'll do the chest x-ray before I go to CT from the emergency room, no matter what the pathology is, whether it's trauma or not. I'm wondering if an ultrasound prior to placement might be a good idea. Some people do it. It's been described in the literature. I have, I don't have excellent experience with ultrasound-guided pneumothoraces, but with ultrasound-guided um, pigtail insertions, I find that it helps, and it helps to define the area that I'm going to be putting the pigtail in. 
And I like to use the, the needle, like I said before, to aspirate beforehand and to see if there's an air pocket. So there is some data out there. Um, I'm waiting to see this study. It should be out this month. Uh, actually, it should be out by now. It's 2018. Well, I'll take a look at the study and I'll update you. But I, I personally have never done it. There are also a bunch of toys like this uh, funnel that you can use. If it works for you, it works for you. I just can't see um, a patient tolerating my insertion of, of, of a funnel to put a chest tube in in the context of a flail chest. I think that it, it, it's excellent for certain patient populations, um, including uh, elective cases, cardiothoracic cases. I think it's phenomenal, but I can't see it being used uh, in the trauma setting or in the acute setting personally. And when you look at bigger data studies, so this is about 100 centers in the UK, what they found was pretty disturbing. You know, these complications, they do happen, and they happen a little bit more than we would like. So misplaced drains have landed in uh, the liver. They've landed in the intraperitoneal space. They've landed all over the place in the spleen, uh, subclavian vessels. Um, they've landed in the chest wall. They've had guide wires being lost. These have all been reported in the UK. And it seems to be fairly uh, distributed among uh, different levels of experience up to consultant level. So this just tells you that it doesn't matter what level you are. You're going to end up with this complication. It's part and parcel of the game. It's what surgery is all about. What's interesting, though, is that whether you're using the Seldinger technique or using the Argyle method, you're going to end up with some sort of complication. And it's the same complication rates, right? The key difference here is that the, the Seldinger technique seems to have a higher complication rate quoted, but so do the respirologists. And I think that that, that might be an influence of training more so than an influence of, of, of specialty. You know, uh, as you can see, um, ICU uh, acute care people such as Im accident emergency, ICU, uh, even interventional radiology and general surgery have extremely low complication rates. And I think that that just reflects the fact that they're trained to do it in, in the manner that I had explained before, that you were supervised at some point and you knew walking in that would be part of your purview, as opposed to in centers where the respirologist is learning and at the same time doing it and is usually doing it uh, as a matter of, of, of lack of availability of specialized staff. And their conclusions mirror ours in that whenever you can do an ultrasound, you should do it. Uh, there should be some competence and adequate supervision. You know, this is, this is a big deal. It's associated with a mortality. You need to identify a lead for training all the staff, and you need to have clinical guidelines in the hospital. And any local incident data should be observed and recorded. And, you know, it's the truth. I, I agree with that completely. I, I have nothing to say based on this data, to be honest. I, I think it's a very frank discussion that proves that you shouldn't be angry at the person who put the chest tube in. You should recognize what to do once the chest tube is in the wrong place. And this would be my sort of take on an approach for it, just looking at all the literature. And it took me about two or three days of persistent reading um, to come up with an approach that I felt was appropriate. So once you have a misplaced chest tube, um, it's either going to be in the chest or abdomen that it's misplaced, or it's going to be subcutaneous. And you're going to use your chest x-ray to figure it out. If it's subcutaneous, then all you have to do is remove the tube and replace it. If you might think that it's in the abdomen or it's in the mediastinum or chest, but misplaced around great vessels, uh, tracheoesophageal area, tracheobronchial area, then it would depend on the patient's presentation, whether they're stable or unstable. Provided that they're stable, you have a chance to do cross-sectional imaging. Cross-sectional imaging, two papers, uh, both of them retrospective, both of them closed access, which is why they're not up here. Both of them quote a better rate of detection with a higher sensitivity, with cross-sectional imaging. So I have no excuse for not taking them to CT scan if they're stable. If your CT scan questions a tracheobronchial or esophageal injury, and bear in mind that this has been reported only five times in the literature, then 
you should do a scope to confirm. Once it's confirmed that there is a clear penetration, so a high-grade esophageal or tracheal injury, a thoracic surgeon should be consulted and the patient should go to the OR. If you notice a vascular or abdominal injury, it's a stab wound to the aorta or the stab wound to the intercostals or a stab wound to the abdomen. Unless it's an intercostal bleed in a hemodynamically stable patient, you should go to the OR. If it is an intercostal bleed for a hemodynamically stable patient, you can make a decision and justify it for going for angiography. By and large, if the chest tube is in situ and it's connected to the IVC or the aorta in any way, operative intervention is the current mainstay. If the chest tube has gone through the liver and the patient is still stable, it stands to reason to take the patient to the OR to take it out under direct visualization, possible packing, and a second look, and to cite a new chest tube. If your CT scan has confirmed that the patient is fine, and your scopes have confirmed that the patient is fine, then you just need to replace the tube to treat the underlying respiratory problem and to take out the old chest tube. If your patient is unstable, you need to figure out why. If they're unstable because they have a tension pneumothorax because of something that you did, such as a buffalo chest, or an intraparenchymal chest tube, or a massive air leak leading to a tension pneumothorax, replace the chest tube and consider removing the first one. If the patient stabilizes, you can go to CT and then remove it. If your patient is unstable because of a persistent air leak, you need to put in a second chest tube. Don't just presume that you punctured the lung. Know that this is trauma. This is an acute situation. Chances are the patient may have come in with it, like the first case that we talked about. The bulk of the literature on buffalo chests describes it as a congenital anomaly, like a horseshoe kidney. So why would I assume that my resident messed up and start shouting at them? If your patient is unstable and you're suspecting bleeding because the chest tube is bringing out blood or because the abdomen is getting more distended or because you've cleared all respiratory concerns and know it's not a tension pneumothorax due to an overwhelming air leak, etc., then you need to decide if the patient is bleeding from the abdomen into the chest because you tore through the diaphragm or they tore through the diaphragm with a bullet wound or something like that or if they're bleeding from the chest isolated you might get lucky if you do a fast the fast might be positive and you'll know to address the abdomen if your fast is positive in the hepatorenal pouch or in the splenic area, then you know that the blood is from the abdomen tracking up into the chest. It could be because of the chest tube. It could be because of the original trauma. It could be because of random causes and events. But you have blood in the abdomen, and you have blood in the chest, and you have a chest tube that looks like it's in the abdomen, and the patient's too unstable to go to CT. So you need to make the decision to operate on the abdomen and recite the chest tube once you've confirmed the site. If there's a question of it being in the chest, you can address the chest later, either through a transdiaphragmatic incision or through a thoracotomy. If your fast is negative and you have blood coming from the chest tube and the patient is agonal or hemodynamically unstable to the extent that you can't go for a CT scan, then you need to do an urgent or emergent thoracotomy and be prepared to clamp off things. Be prepared to clamp off the aorta for resuscitative purposes be prepared to eviscerate the pericardium, confirm no cardiac injury, and be prepared to treat it like a stab wound to the chest with a witness drop in vital signs, just like an ED thoracotomy. So in conclusion, remember, don't shout at your resident at the time. Don't take it out on the resident, please. The morale there, it takes a hit. Your whole team takes a hit, right? Ultimately, we're not a family. Uh, I'm not your mother, father, sister, or brother, but I would like to think that we have to maintain some professionalism and we have to treat each other with some dignity. And, you know, that might involve you trying to figure out whether or not this has happened in the literature before. That might involve you listening to this and maybe coming up with your own hospital protocols. But you should have something to back your residents up when these known complications happen, okay? Make sure that you consent patients, if you can, 
because this is a procedure with a known complication. Prepare for the complication. And remember, being fast negative doesn't mean that there's no abdominal involvement. Being fast negative with blood coming from the chest with a patient who's agonal just means that you need to clamp the aorta to get a blood pressure back in order to address the abdomen if it's there. So fast positive means something. Fast negative means nothing. Okay? Thank you for listening. And uh, I hope I didn't scare you away from putting in chest tubes because I personally like putting them in. And despite what complications were quoted for the uh, cell danger technique, I think that for pigtails, it's going to be the future, especially for pneumothoraces. I, I can't see us not doing pigtails for them. But that's a topic for another day. This is Saud Al-Zaid. Thank you for listening and please subscribe.